This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, the instructor for this course, and this is Lecture 17, Part 2 in our three-part series on ion implantation. Our reading is Chapter 5 of our textbook by Campbell. We've talked about how ion implantation works, but now let's talk about how we model the results of ion in implantation and the process of ion implantation. When a high energy ion is bombards a solid, and it hits a solid and like a bullet slams into it, uh, what happens? What happens to this ion when it enters the solid? Well, there's two basic things. The ion can interact with the electron cloud that surrounds a nucleus of, say, the silicon atom, or that ion can interact with the nucleus of the silicon atom. And the interactions will be very different than those two. As the ion goes through, the positively charged ion goes through the cloud of electrons that surround all the silicon atoms, there's a drag effect. It's going to slow down. Uh, because of the attraction of the positive charge with the negative charges. But if that ion penetrates the cloud and gets close to the nucleus of the silicon atom, now I've got a positive-positive repulsion phenomenon going on, and we're going to get a scattering of the ion off of the silicon nucleus. So we want to be able to model uh, these steps, and we'll have a couple of different ways of doing that. First, let's look at that energy loss piece, sometimes called drag. The drag force is proportional to the ion velocity. Uh, it turns out to be true for uh, ions going through a solid and parachuters jumping out of an airplane. Drag force proportional to the velocity. And the velocity is proportional to the square root of the energy. The kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, so v is proportional to the square root of the energy. The energy loss per unit length as we travel through the crystal will therefore be proportional to the square root of the energy of the ion E. The proportionality constant, Ke, uh, is going to depend on the masses and the atomic numbers of both the ion and the target atom. We're going to look exclusively at silicon uh, here, but obviously we can implant into lots of different materials, not just silicon wafers. Uh, but the, the ion will have a number of different uh, atomic masses and numbers because of the different um, species of dopants that will be implanted. As a result, we'll get different uh, energy loss um, coefficients. But energy loss is only one way in which the ion is interacting with the crystal. The other is scattering. This is a, a Rutherford scattering, a Coulomb scattering. We have a positive ion it's close enough to the positive nucleus of the silicon atom and it bounces off. These scattering events are mostly elastic. There's some inelastic um, scattering that can happen as well, but it's mostly elastic, meaning there's no energy loss in the scattering event. We have a, a change in the direction of the ion as it bounces off, but the energy loss comes from the drag with the uh, electrons more so than the scattering off of the nuclei. The scattered angle and the mean free path between scattering events are both probabilistic. They're described with uh, a probability distribution functions and they're uh, random processes. So we can think of uh, the scattering as having two kinds of results. So here's a positive ion I show in the blue and it's heading towards the nucleus of a silicon atom here in the, the red. And it gets close and there's a repulsion and so the, the ion changes its direction. We call this a forward scattering event because the ion's still moving forward in the direction, basic direction it was going in to begin with, but it's now going off in a, in a slightly different direction. But we can also get back scattering. Um, Rutherford famously in his backscattering experiment proved that atoms were made of core nuclei by looking at these rare backscatter events. If this ion uh, happens to hit the silicon nucleus dead on, it's going to just bounce straight back. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So we can get both forward scattering and back scattering from this Rutherford scattering or Columbic scattering events. And there are mathematical equations that, that talk about uh, the nature of these uh, scattering events, their probabilities, etc. Uh, we're not going to go into any of the math here, but we want to have an intuitive feel for the kinds of mechanisms. So now we have this energy loss mechanism, so the, the ion slowing down as it's traveling, uh, and, and it's a function of how far it travels, so the path length. And then there are going to be random scattering events as the ion interacts with the nuclei in the substrate. We'll be able to simulate both of these with what is called a Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo, of course, gets its name from the gambling mecca uh, of Monte Carlo uh, and the games of chance that they offer there, uh, because this is a simulation where we use lots of random numbers. Uh, so, for example, in the, uh, we have uh, an ion that's approaching a, a nucleus, and the exact position of the ion rel relative to the nucleus is pretty much random. So the angle that it will scatter at is uh, a random number. Um, also, this thing will travel a certain distance before its next scattering event, and so we'll use another random number to represent how far it goes before it, it runs into another nuclei and scatters again. In that way, we'll be able to trace out the path of a single ion as it travels through the target and eventually comes to a stop, loses enough energy that it stops traveling and is deposited at a specific position in the substrate. But that path is a, is a, r a random process so that knowing just that one path doesn't really tell us a whole bunch. Instead, we're going to repeat this simulation. We'll trace the path of a single ion, find out where it lands, then we'll repeat it. But because of these random numbers, it will trace, trace out a different path and land at a different place. We do this a million times, and we'll get a statistical distribution of the ion locations at the end of each one of these scattering simulations. The result looks something like this. This is uh, simulations from um, software uh, available on this website, referred to in the Campbell book as well. And each one of these blue lines represents a uh, Monte Carlo simulation of a single ion trajectory. And then that ion scatters and eventually comes to a halt at some point. For example, here, uh, all these little black dots are the locations where the ions have come to rest. Now we're not showing you know, more than 100 or 200 ions here. Uh, when in a real simulation we might do a million or more uh, to get better statistics. But nonetheless, you can get a feeling for the kind of scattering uh, that's going on by just looking at these uh, random trajectories from the Monte Carlo simulation. Well, this is all well and good, but I'll bet if you thought about it, tracing the trajectories of one particle at a time and then doing it a million times, this is a slow simulation. <coughs> so generally, we want to do this kind of simulation once, and then we want to extract from it the most important statistical properties of the final distribution of ion locations, and then summarize the results. Instead of of saying, well, here's a million locations in X, Y, and Z, uh, for or uh, maybe just uh, Z in radial position in cylindrical coordinates, uh, of the, all of the one million ions we simulated. Instead, we want to summarize statistically all of those positions. And one very common way to do that is to apply a Gaussian model of the final resting place for each one of these ions. Uh, we'll just simply say, the final distribution of ions is uh, Gaussian in shape. There's a mean position. Um, we call that R sub P. The projected range is simply the mean of the Gaussian. Then the Gaussian has a standard deviation. We use the symbol delta R sub P, and we call it the straggle. I really like that term. It's much more uh, descriptive than just standard deviation. The straggle of these ions uh, come on, let's look back at this. They look like straggle. That looks like straggle to me. So uh, I can see why the spread would be called the straggle. 
But mathematically, the straggle is the standard deviation of the Gaussian fit to the positions of all of these uh, ions. And finally, the dose, which is simply the number of dopants per square centimeter that is impinging on the surface. So with these three parameters, we can fit the Monte Carlo results, or we can fit experimental data. You might recall a few lectures ago, we mentioned SIMS, um, secondary ion mass spectroscopy, as a way of measuring the doping profile. Well, we can do that after ion implantation and uh, get an experimental ion dopant uh, distribution. Uh, so either the Monte Carlo results or the experimental data we fit to a Gaussian, uh, and, and uh, this would be the equation that we would fit to with those three parameters. One of them, the dose, is generally uh, set by the ion implantation process. <coughs> then the two parameters we're trying to extract would be the projected range, RP, and the straggle, delta RP. And you can see from this a cartoon of, of trajectories, what that might look like. The projected range, the mean value of the positions of all of those particles, is something like this. Um, the straggle is the standard deviation of all the positions. Uh, in this case, the vertical standard deviation of the positions of those ions. But if you look closely, well, not even that closely. If you just look at it, you'll notice that there's a spread laterally as well, left to right, not just up and down. In fact, there's going to be a second standard deviation, the standard deviation laterally, which we call delta R perpendicular. This is called the transverse straggle or the lateral straggle. We use those two terms interchangeably. And the, the straggle and the transverse straggle or the lateral straggle aren't necessarily the same value. <coughs> me. In, in, in general, they're not the same value. So uh, lateral uh, scattering uh, comes from uh, the, 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 the same scattering events that causes vertical straggle, but it's a little bit different. Uh, it's a function of the, how light the elements are compared to the silicon. Uh, the lighter elements uh, have more backscattering, and that results in a larger amounts of lateral scattering as well. So for arsenic and antimony, the, the transverse straggle is about equal to the straggle. For phosphorus, the transverse straggle is a little bit more. It's about 20% higher than the straggle. And for boron, which is the lightest dopant that we use, the transverse straggle is typically about twice the straggle in the vertical direction. These are rough rules of thumb that, that are useful um, to understand. There is some energy dependence to uh, these relationships, so you know, these are just, like I said, rules of thumb. <clears throat> but why is that important? The lateral straggle is not important if I were just um, uh, scattering, uh, implanting over a large open area, but we never do that. We, we scatter through a mask, um, so we have an edge where uh, some part of the, the wafer is being blocked where there's no implant, and another part uh, allows the implant to go through. So uh, if we integrate this Gaussian over half of a space, we get uh, a complementary error function. Let me, let me try to explain that with a picture. If I have a silicon wafer um, that I want to implant into, but I cover up half of it with uh, a silicon dioxide mask, and I start implanting straight down, uh, the mask prevents uh, the implant from making into silicon underneath the silicon dioxide. But in the other region, uh, the exposed region, the unmasked region, we get the full uh, concentration of the dopants. What happens at the edge? We get an error function shape. So this shape here is the shape of a complementary error function going from about 0 to about 100 percent, um, symmetrically centered at y equals 0. And the amount of spread, the, the width of this transition region from the highest implant dose to the lowest uh, implant concentration, I mean, 
the highest concentration is over here to the lowest here. The width of that transition region is given by this transverse straggle. So how do we find these model parameters? Well, the mo Gaussian model, <coughs> excuse me, the Gaussian model can be fit either to the Monte Carlo simulations or to experimental data, as I mentioned. But also, the straggle can be estimated from the projected range. <coughs> uh, the problem with recording a lecture with a cold. Um, the straggle is not independent of the projected range, and you can see from this equation how they're related. Uh, it's a function of the mass of the ion and of the target. But typically, <coughs> we get uh, straggles that are about a quarter to a third of the projected range for typical uh, dopant ions. Another thing to note is that the Gaussian model becomes skewed for lighter dopants. That's due to the backscattering. The lighter the dopant, the more backscattering events that we get. And this skew is a skew of <coughs> of the uh, higher concentrations of dopant near the top surface because of the higher amounts of backscattering. What do we do about that? Well, if we're OK with the skew, then what we want to do is simply characterize the skewed distribution better. So instead of using a Gaussian, which is not skewed, it's perfectly symmetric about the mean, uh, instead of using a Gaussian, we use the Pearson 4 distribution. If we don't like this, the, the skew and we want a more symmetric distribution, we need to use a heavier dopant. And one thing we do with boron is to use boron difluoride as the uh, ion that's being implanted rather than pure boron. Here are some examples of experimental um, parameters, model parameters of the range and uh, the straggle. Projected range here is, is labeled as range, and the straggle here is labeled as sigma, sigma of the Gaussian. For phosphorus and ar arsenic and antimony, uh, the n-type dopants on the left, and uh, boron and gallium, the p-type dopants on the right. And if you compare the scales of sigma on the right and range on the left, you see that typically you're going to see about a quarter. Um, the, the, the sigma is about a quarter of the range. These graphs, by the way, come from the Campbell textbook. So in lecture 17, what have you learned? Uh, you've probably learned that it's irritating to listen to a lecture by somebody who has a cough. I apologize for that, but hopefully you've learned some other things too. Hopefully you've learned um, what processes affect the trajectory of an ion through a wafer. Think about the physics of, of an ion passing through the crystal of a wafer. What processes affect that trajectory? <coughs> Explain the Monte Carlo simulations of ion implantation. What is a Monte Carlo simulation? What does that mean? How does it work? explain it in basic terms. What are the parameters used in the Gaussian model of an implant distribution? What are their names and what are their meanings? And finally, define straggle and the transverse straggle. Next time we'll, we'll finish up our three lectures on ion implantation by talking about some other important phenomenon such as channeling. Till then. <coughs>